Um, this conference will now be recorded. The, um, how, how are the energy balance? Um, let's take a quick look at that. Um, so here um, at the bottom, we see, um, yeah, if we are absorbing four units of energy, um, that would be um, outside, yeah, um, our heat pump sitting outside, absorbing uh, thermal energy. Um, let's use the example of four units. And then we um, assume that we have to spend one unit of energy to uh, run the heat pump to operate the compressor. And that, um, yeah, four plus one um, gives us five uh, units of usable energy um, that we could use to, to heat our house or heat, yeah, heat the water primarily. <clears throat> so that is in, um, in heating mode. In cooling mode, if yeah, if we turn it around, um, we would um, be using this absorption of the four units. So our cooling effect would be four uh, units. Again, we would need one unit to operate, and and then we would be shedding those five units of uh, thermal energy outside um, to get rid of them in in uh, cooling mode. Um, so very very simple. Um, it's in reality certainly a lot more complex, but um, I think this illustrates pretty well um, how uh, a heat pump works. Um, and, and yeah, this is how our efficiency comes about. Um, uh, yeah, so the when we um, uh, put the the usable energy in relation to uh, what we pay for. So we pay for one unit of energy to, to operate it. Um, in this case, five units of usable energy for heating would be 500% efficient. Um, if we are using uh, it for cooling and we are getting four usable units of um, cooling energy, um, our coefficient of performance would be 400%, 404 to one. <clears throat> Yeah, because our heat pump sits outside in the outside air, um, yeah, it very much depends. The, the performance depends on um, the outside conditions. And the colder it is outside, the fewer BTUs are available to uh, harvest. And um, so our output, our um, heating output of the heat pump, unfortunately, that goes down. The colder is, it is outside. Um, at the same time, the colder it is outside, our heating load of the building um, is going up. And so we have those two curves that are opposing each other. Oops. <clears throat> so the, um, the orange curve, the orange line here, that um, illustrates the heating load of our building. Um, yeah, at 65 degrees, we have no heating load. Uh, we're perfectly comfortable in the house. Um, but as colder it is, um, it, it's colder as it gets, the, the higher our uh, heating load gets. Um, yeah, so this is down here at the bottom, we have the outside uh, temperature uh, displayed. Um, and the, the load um, here on the vertical. And um, these two curves are uh, performance curves of two um, of the heat pumps, they are um, Arctic air to water heat pumps. Um, uh, yeah, this one here is the uh, is the 50 um, that um, delivers about 60,000 uh, BTUs at um, 60 degrees, and and this one here is uh, the 60 that um, delivers about 90,000 BTUs at 60 degrees, and um, that as you can see, those output goes outputs go down um, the colder it is, and so we need to match those. Yeah, when we're doing our analysis, our building analysis, um, we need to match that with our, the heating load of our, our building. Uh, for instance, the manual J, when, when we do a manual J um, heating load simulation. Um, where those two curves intersect, um, that's uh, what's called the balance point. Um, and so the heat pump is able to heat the house up to that temperature. Um, yeah, in this case, uh, about five degrees, and then um, below five degrees, we would need to have some supplemental heat 
in order to um, deliver the distance the difference um, yeah once the the heat pump is is not able to keep up anymore um, in this case here um, yeah, the other uh, the big one uh, the 60 um, would be able to deliver um, t uh, yeah uh, energy below zero degrees minus minus seven something like that um, so um, when we are, um, are are doing um, an analysis and and trying to fit um, a heat pump um, to a home, we need to look at our uh, the local climate. Um, yeah, what is um, what are the temperatures um, that um, we will experience at that location? When you have a boiler, you don't really care um, because the the boiler you know, has access to the natural gas. Um, but when we uh, use a heat pump um, and that is affected by the outside climate, we, we want to know um, yeah, how cold does it get and, and for how long. So this is, this is a chart um, re recorded here in, in Boulder um, over a number of years, um, indicating yeah, the um, lowest temperatures, yeah, minus five degrees here a few times, um, but but only very briefly, um, and um, uh, yeah, how how hot does it get? Uh, over 100 degrees. So yeah, we certainly do need air conditioning. Um, um, we are with the the climate that that we have uh, today. <clears throat> um, this is a different chart um, that um, shows very similar. Um, information uh, down at the bottom we have temperatures um, so from 100 degrees uh, down into the negative uh, degrees and 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 the columns here they show how many hours in a year um, of um, a certain temperature range um, do we experience um, and so if we're looking here at the interval between 10 and 15 degrees uh, Fahrenheit we can expect uh, slightly more than 100 hours in a year at, at this temperature um, temperature range. Um, so this is this is called a bin temperature chart, a bin hour temperature chart, um, and it it shows us um, yeah here for Boulder for instance um, uh, it's it's relatively mild yeah most the the vast majority of hours. Um, is, yeah between 30 degrees uh, Fahrenheit and uh, 75 degrees Fahrenheit um, so yeah that's that's why um, it's so comfortable living here on the front range um, because we yeah, the vast majority of our uh, time of the year is um, is really comfortable and and in in that temperature range our heat pump um, if we remember the performance curve operates really well at really high efficiencies and a really nice output. Um, here is uh, the same chart uh, overlaid with the heat pump performance. And so here, um, yeah, it, it gets very busy. I, I understand that. Um, but this is part of the analysis that I do when I'm uh, talking to some clients. Um, so how many hours yeah, if if this is our balance point right here at uh, somewhere around 10 degrees, uh, in this example, um, how many hours in a year um, of supplemental heat do I need to support my heat pump? Um, yeah, when it's uh, no longer able to keep up. And um, yeah, so in this case, I don't know. These columns would probably add up to somewhere around 350 hours. Uh, and um, yeah, so we can calculate what is our supplemental heat um, load and and um, how much um, uh, how many extra kilowatt hours do we uh, need to spend in order to support that. Um, what is a typical system? Um, a typical system for um, with an um, hydronic heat pump. Um, so this is um, a very basic system. It's a heating only um, 
system with uh, inflow radiant. Um, here's our, our heat pump that sits outside. Um, Sean, is, Sean, is the dog coming from your end? The, the dog is actually on my side. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you, you talking to me there, John? No, I'm on mute, I think. Dog, dog says hello. <clears throat> um, yeah, so this is a, uh, a piping and wiring diagram um, for a very basic system, a heating only uh, system. Um, so heat pump um, loads a buffer tank. Um, that buffer tank can be equipped with an electric backup element. Um, and then from here, we um, would pipe it into the, you know, the on the system side. And this radiant side, the system here on this side with, with zone valves and um, with a zoning panel and thermostats, that is identical to yeah, a, a boiler system, that um, high efficiency boiler system that you would um, yeah, uh, find in, in many homes um, already. <clears throat> um, here's a, a system example uh, for a heating and cooling system. I, I mentioned that our heat pumps um, also provide uh, chilled water. And um, so this is a very, uh, also a very simple system, um, again, with a buffer tank. Um, so in the winter time, this uh, buffer tank um, is charged with um, hot water. And in the summertime, it's uh, charged with uh, chilled water. Um, uh, so it, um, in this case, we would have a seasonal switchover between uh, summer and winter. Um, uh, yeah, that assumes that in our building we don't have simultaneous heating and cooling. Um, if that was the case, we would need two tanks, a hot tank and a cold tank. And so the other zones would then pick either if it's a uh, a cooling call and um, get served from the cold tank. Um, if it's a heating call, um, get served from the hot tank. But um, we're certainly trying to avoid that. That makes the system very complex, uh, makes it expensive. And um, obviously, yeah, or honestly, that is, um, um, uh, yeah, if, if you have a home that, that requires heating and cooling simultaneously, on the same day at the same hour, um, that kind of tells me that it's not a very efficient home. Um, that um, we should probably look at some energy efficiency improvements first um, to try to avoid that because that is certainly going to drive your energy bills up. Um, what this also shows here is our fan is, is fan coils um, for cooling. Um, we could certainly do um, radiant cooling if you have an in-slab uh, radiant system that, that can be used for radiant cooling. Um, it's a little more uh, complex uh, because obviously we need to stay away from the dew point. We don't want to have any condensation on our floors or inside our floors. Um, that would be uh, tragic. Um, so a radiant cooling system, while it's very comfortable and works in the background, has no uh, draft. Um, or, or no noise, um, it, um, it is a little more complex um, because we need to yeah, consider humidity. Um, <clears throat> so fan coils are a much uh, simpler way of uh, doing air conditioning. Um, and I, I will get to that in a, in a little bit. Um, here's a system that also does domestic hot water. Um, so it's a heating and, um, I'm sorry, where are we here? Um, there, so this is a, um, a space heating and domestic hot water system. Um, so in our buffer tank, in this case, we do have um, a coil that uh, preheats our domestic hot water, um, which then flows into the actual domestic hot water tank. And um, so this provides um, a, 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 a domestic hot water buffering. Um, and it, um, yeah, if some people require 140 degrees um, water temperature, that so this um, actual uh, domestic tank here would then boost the temperature up a few more degrees. Um, and um, yeah, if someone has a larger uh, bathtub, a soaking bathtub, for instance, um, that would um, add the required capacity. <clears throat> 
Um, here we have a system, you know, this is a, a larger home, and so that requires two heat pumps. Um, that's certainly not a problem. Um, we can uh, cascade them. Um, yeah, the system would start up with one heat pump, and then uh, it would bring on a second one um, if needed. Um, and it would also rotate them, so uh, both heat pumps get the same um, runtime um, and wear and tear. Uh, so that is all um, possible and um, yeah, not a problem. Um, I, I see this this kind of a situation um, more often when we do uh, domestic hot water and space heating in one, um, because yeah, when we have a, a really well insulated home, um, the um, the domestic hot water can easily double our um, our heating load. Um, so, uh, actually, in a in a passive house, for instance, in a true passive house, um, the domestic hot water load is actually greater than the space heating load. And so, um, it's possible that um, if we combine both and we ask the heat pump to provide um, heating and domestic, um, that we might actually need uh, two heat pumps. Here is a situation. Um, where um yeah we have natural gas in the house anyway um I, yeah i do help a lot, a lot of clients who want to cut the gas line and and go all electric um but i have also clients who want to keep their gas range uh, for cooking or they want to keep their gas fireplace and so if we if we do have gas in the house anyway and we're paying the the monthly connection charge we could certainly um use a, a natural gas boiler um, for the backup. And, and this would be a, um, yeah, a way of, of piping that um, in um, on it basically on demand um, into the supply piping to the system. Um, and um, yeah, we could also use the, uh, the boiler for our domestic hot water in this case. Um, so this is an actual system that um, is being installed right now, um, we yeah we are very flexible. Um, the um, controls and uh, piping is is very flexible. Uh, what's possible um, here instead of the um, natural gas boiler, we uh, can also use um, an electric boiler. Uh, Hydro Shark is is one of those brands. Um, works um, extremely well and reliable as well um so for um folks who don't um have natural gas and want to go all electric um that is uh, yeah very much a viable option <clears throat> a few things um if we are in new construction um and you're considering considering a heat pump it's a good idea to install your radiant piping um uh, more densely than uh, what has traditionally been done. Uh, so traditionally, um, radiant piping was installed 12 inch on center. Um, I always recommend going down to a six inch on center, so doubling the uh, the piping per square foot. Um, adds very little cost, but it increases the output by uh, a good 50%. Um, so that allows our heat pump to um, run more efficiently. Um, we, are, we are able to run a, a cooler water through the radiant. Um, uh, that allows the heat pump to run more efficiently. And um, it also allows the heat pump to run at lower outdoor temperatures. If, yeah, if we are not trying uh, to work it really hard and, and produce um, higher water temperatures, um, it, it will um, run down at, at lower outdoor temperatures. <clears throat> um, what I should say is then, uh, if you have um, a, a really well insulated home and you're installing inflow radiant, um, you are um, yeah. If you are used to radiant from a not so well insulated home, um, yeah, you, you're probably used to feeling the radiant heat um, uh, under your feet, and that's actually not very healthy. Uh, there are some health concerns from from walking. Um, yeah, uh, consistently walking on on very warm floors. Um, 
and and so in a super insulated home um, where yeah we are able to uh, uh, heat the house with maybe 90 95 degree water temperature um, you will not feel the heat uh, from the, the floor as you walk barefoot on it um, simply be, yeah because um, it's um, the surface temperature is not that warm and um, it, it still heats the house uh, perfectly fine um, in the background um, yeah and, and you will feel the the ultimate comfort of the inflow radiant um, but um, yeah I'm, on occasion I'm getting uh, calls from uh, clients who are saying I'm I'm not feeling it when I walk on the radiant floor um, is it really working um, yes your house is is keeping the uh, the target room temperature perfectly fine um, but it's it does not feel like uh, walking across the floor in in a spa um, because yeah it it doesn't require the the higher water temperatures that um, you may be um, familiar with <clears throat> here um, uh, an example are fan coils um, and including a picture in an actual home. This is a home in Denver. Um, yeah, the, these these fan coils here, they look like mini splits, um, but they are hydronic, so they work with hot and cold water. Um, <clears throat> these are consoles. Um, these, they can be installed under a window. They look a little like the European panel radiators, European style panel radiators. Um, I, I get the question a lot is, yeah, the, these are, are not very uh, attractive. Uh, they look like a retrofit. Um, and, and I agree. Um, yeah, initially you're probably going to um, notice them, but, but if you look at this picture here, the unit on the wall, um, I'm, I'm pretty sure the homeowners by now, yeah, they've been in the house for six months. Um, they are not uh, noticing them anymore. They, they blend right in. Um, over time. Here are uh, the three performance curves, uh, or the, the performance curves of the three heat pumps that um, Arctic is offering. Um, we recently changed the model number, so um, we actually have a 35, a 50, and a 60 uh, today. Um, but these are the three um, uh, curves based on the outdoor temperature. Um, uh, but for some reason the outdoor temperature has disappeared down at the bottom um so um the um here on the left hand side it, it should say minus 10 degrees fahrenheit and here on the right hand side we are at 70 degrees uh, fahrenheit um so our output um yeah somewhere between um slightly under 20,000 btus um and um, and about 70,000 BTUs, depending on the outdoor temperature. Um, and these, um, the three colors here for each one of those sizes, um, they are different water temperatures. Um, so 95, 105, and 115 degrees uh, Fahrenheit water temperature. Um, a question I get a lot is, um, what is the operating cost of a heat pump? Um, is um, is it going to save me money if I switch from um, a natural gas boiler to uh, to a heat pump? <clears throat> and um, that is actually a pretty complex uh, question. Um, here, uh, here's an example um, uh, of um, uh, some research. Um, so natural gas. Um, if you have natural gas, you know that uh, the prices, uh, they fluctuate. Um, it gets expensive during the summertime and it gets um, relatively cheap um, during the winter time. Um, so it, um, it depends on the season. But if we, um, if we use a, an annual average um, and you convert the natural gas, the therms, uh, uh, into BTUs and then into kilowatt hours, um, the um, it costs about four cents um, per thermal uh, kilowatt hour natural gas. <clears throat> Our electricity here um, costs about twelve cents per kilowatt hour. 
Um, yeah, here Excel Energy, we don't have time of use pricing right now, so um, it's the same day and night. Um, propane, if we look at um, LPG cost, um, uh, yeah, recent uh, recently it was about two dollars a gallon. Um, if we convert that um, into BTUs and then kilowatt hours, it's about seven cents per kilowatt hours at um, two dollars a gallon. <clears throat> that means um, yeah, four cents um, versus twelve cents um, is um, a third. That means our heat pump would have to be 300% uh, efficient, at least in order to produce heat at the same cost as a 90% efficient natural gas boiler or furnace. Um, yeah, if you have a, a high efficiency condensing uh, boiler or furnace, it's here at, at altitude 6,000 feet. Um, it's roughly six. Uh, it's roughly 90% efficient. Um, so. If our heat pump is at at least 300% efficient, it would um, produce um, yeah, heat your house at the same cost as as uh, your natural gas appliance. <clears throat> um, because uh, propane is more expensive, 180% um, is is already a break even for uh, a heat pump compared to propane. Um, yeah, that means. Um, Operating cost is about the same uh, if we assume 300% efficiency for for a natural gas um, uh, area. And and here on the front range, yeah, if you are um, at the edge of the prairie, 300% um, is is a number that uh, an Arctic heat pump can achieve uh, yeah, over the um, average averaging over a year. Um, yeah, less efficient, obviously, um, when it's really cold. But um, as we've seen, you know, the, we have a lot of milder hours in a year. So um, uh, I'm confident that 300% we, we, we can uh, achieve with our heat pump. As you get up higher, um, get up to NED um, or Winter Park, um, your efficiency will be lower. Um, so there. Um, uh, you you may um, have a higher operating cost, except if you uh, generate your own electricity with with a local PV system. Yeah, uh, your locally generated PV energy, the kilowatt hour is is probably um, yeah, depending on how much you pay for your PV system, um, between five and and seven cents, and and so yeah, that uh, certainly bumps you into. Um, yeah, a pricing category where um, the heat pump again, even at altitude, is um, and colder climates is um, it, it can be cost effective. Um, a related question is how about the carbon emissions? Um, yeah, if I go to an all electric home and heat it with a, a heat pump, um, how are my carbon emissions compared to a natural gas appliance? And um, so a little research I did, um, I looked at you know, uh, publicly available um, energy administration data um, yeah, for the year 2019, this is the latest uh, data available. Um, so much electricity was generated um, for Colorado or, or was uh, consumed in Colorado uh, in 2019 and resulting in um, this many pounds of uh, carbon emissions, and if you um, put those numbers in relation, um, yeah, that um, uh, results in 1.32 pounds uh, of um, carbon dioxide um, or carbon per uh, kilowatt hour electric. Um, the same source uh, of information um, says that natural gas um, a million BTUs uh, results in 117 pounds of carbon emissions. Um, if you um, translate that down um, to a 90% efficient um, uh, furnace or boiler, um, it um, results in 0.44 pounds um, uh, per kilowatt hour um, uh, natural gas uh, uh, combustion appliance 
With uh, propane, it's slightly higher, 0.53 pounds um, for a 90% efficient furnace or boiler. Um, and so again, yeah, if we put that in relation 1.32 versus 0.44 or 0.53 uh, pounds of uh, carbon, um, yeah, it's it's roughly again a factor of three right here. Um, that means if our heat pump is 300% efficient, that means yeah, it's um, it is producing the energy, the thermal energy um, at the same emissions as um, the natural gas appliance. Um, uh, it, it um, again can be um, slightly less efficient uh, in comparison to a propane appliance. Um, again, the same situation um, as on the cost side. Yeah, if you are generating your own emission-free uh, local PV electricity, um, you're obviously ahead. Um, yeah, you're, um, the heat pump at that point will be uh, clearly uh, greener in terms of emissions than a natural gas or propane appliance. Hope that all makes sense. Um, it's, it's a very rough um, uh, estimation and there certainly are, yeah, there, there's emissions, um, uh, yeah, fracking and uh, pipeline leaks and so forth. Um, obviously, I was not able to take those into account, uh, but um, it, it, I think it gives um, gives you a good idea of, of where we are. Um, if your goal is to reduce your uh, your home's uh, carbon emissions, um, as everybody is is talking about electric cars, um, I think um, electrifying our home um, is is at least as important. And um, we now have technology um, if you have a hydronic system in your home um, and yeah, a very similar um, approach also applies to mini splits uh, yeah, forced air if you have a forced air system um, efficiencies are um, and operating costs are very similar um, so um, yeah I don't see that as a, a competitive um, uh, technology. Um, yeah, you know, there people are uh, either hydronic or the air force air people, um, and what, whatever your preference is, um, uh, there's um, high efficiency appliances available uh, on the market today that um, allow uh, people to to make that transition. <clears throat> so, quick summary: um, heat pumps are um, a, a very um, established technology, um, uh, yeah, we are. We they have been around for for many years, um, but a lot of uh, advances um, have been made in recent years. The other um, hyperheat um, technology Mitsubishi is using um, um, electronic um, vapor injection. Uh, Arctic heat pumps are using, um, and and some other technologies. Um, uh, just came about in recent years, and there's a lot of research is, is going into heat pumps. So we will see um, more efficient uh, heat pumps coming uh, to the marketplace um, in the next few years. And um, uh, yeah, the, the temperature um, uh, will um, uh, continue to the operating temperature will continue to drop, and um, uh, yeah, there's um, climate-friendly refrigerants um, are being um, tested right now. Uh, yeah, the other 410A that is being used today, um, it does not kill the ozone uh, layer anymore, like the Freons uh, 20 years ago. But it certainly, if it were to escape, um, it is it, its greenhouse gas potential is is significant. Um, so. Um, uh, a different climate friendly refrigerants like uh, carbon dioxide are being tested um but um the, yeah it it very much affects the the whole heat pump and so um it, it um i believe it it yeah you know, for it to become my mainstream um it it a, a few more years it it will take before uh, those um will be um everywhere Heat pumps, very low maintenance, um, 
they are very reliable, um, dependable, and um, so an all-electric home is, um, yeah, we certainly don't want to give you the range anxiety that um, you might get from an electric car, some, some electric cars. Um, uh, so, um, yeah, it's, it is very much a, uh, a technology that um, is available and um, it, it's not a stretch. So you're not going to be a, a guinea pig if, if that's what you are considering. Um, <clears throat> um, yeah, I haven't talked about net zero energy at all, um, but if that's your goal, um, yeah, you have to be all electric and um, uh, yeah, a heat pump is um, is the way to go uh, to go all electric. And um, I can help you uh, calculate what your uh, energy consumption is, um, so um, you can size your PV system accordingly. Um, I've I've written uh, many letters uh, to Excel um, Energy. Yeah, they they only allow you um, 120 percent of your energy consumption. Uh, to be produced by your PV system, um, at least with the current um, Utilities Commission rules, um, I, I understand that they are being revised, um, reconsidered, but that's the, the rule right now. Um, so I've, I've written um, many letters um, doing calculations, um, providing calculations um, for, for people to um, get to the 120%. Um, there's incentives available, um, Energy Smart here in Boulder County. Um, many um, utilities, I'm talking to several utilities on the Western Slope um, that are offering utilities, uh, uh, utility rebates. Um, Holy Cross, for instance, in the Roaring Fork Valley, uh, Carbondale, uh, Aspen, uh, Glenwood Springs, they're offering $800 uh, per, per ton of heat pump capacity. Uh, that, is, that is a tremendous, um, tremendous help for, for homeowners. Um, and, and I'm seeing a lot of um, interest from other utilities. Yeah, um, the, the mountain towns, people are really worried about losing their winters. And, and so they, they are working really hard on um, uh, lowering carbon carbon emissions within their territory, and and so uh, incentives are uh, are part of that. Um, certainly, uh, I can help with uh, doing research. Um, you don't want to leave any money on the table. <clears throat> yeah, that's pretty much my presentation. Um, I'm happy to answer questions. I've I've seen a couple um, pop up. Um, uh, and yeah, by all means, please, uh, please reach out um, to me. Um, Arctic Heat Pumps, uh, the, the website is arcticheatpumps.com. Um, and um, yeah, my, um, my email address, hans at brightsense.com. Um, please feel free to reach out um, and I'd be happy to discuss your project. Thank you very much, Hans. That was great. Um, we've got one question from Martin, and this would be in reference to a retrofit situation. Can the Arctic heat pump uh, handle both hydronic floor heating uh, and forced air? Yes, the the answer is yes. Um, it um, both can be done. Um, and yeah, um, a forced air system um, has its advantages. Um, it's a lot quicker to respond uh, than a radiant. Yeah, a radiant might might take a couple hours to come up to temperature. And um, so, if we have a cold spell um, sometime in in June, um, um, and it wouldn't make sense just for a few hours to to fire up the radiant, um, if you have a forced air component uh, for instance for your for your air conditioning uh, by all means yeah just uh, pipe the the hot water to it and 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 you will um, you will have heat uh, almost instantly um, so yeah um, that can certainly be done and um, I, I see it done uh, quite frequently 
from, from Bill, uh, does the Arctic publish COP data on the various outdoor temps and HSPF data? <clears throat> uh, yes, we, we do have COP data. Um, um, at this point, we, we don't have um, HSPF, so that's the heating seasonal performance factor. Um, it, it, it's actually uh, quite complicated to calculate that because um, it depends, very much depends on yeah, the climate. Um, and um, yeah, so it, um, um, so at this point we don't ha don't have HSPF. Um, there, um, a related question is um, uh, Energy Star um, certification um, is also not available uh, at this point because simply there is no category for air to water heat pumps right now. It's it's still a relatively new um, uh, technology. Um, it is being developed. Uh, yeah, Energy Star criteria are being developed, and and once those are available, we will certainly uh, uh, get that certification. Um, but um, at this point, it, um, it's it's not available. But um, we certainly, yeah, some some utilities they want to. Uh, yeah, they're saying in order for our for us to give you the the rebate money. Um, yeah, we need to have an Energy Star certificate. Um, we have been able to uh, supply our performance data, and and they have accepted that in in all instances so far. Uh, so, to define a COP coefficient of performance, if you can summarize that real quick. Um, I can certainly pull it up, um, but. Um, Basically, it would take me a few minutes. So I, I, let me just um, uh, uh, say it um, in, yeah, verbally. Um, so you can expect uh, um, at 47 degrees outdoor temperature, you can expect um, a COP of between three and three and a half. So yeah, between 300 and 350 percent efficient. Um, at uh, as you drop down to about zero degrees and below zero, um, we are still around two, um, a COP of two, um, so 200% efficient. Um, uh, yeah, as it gets down into the negative temperatures, uh, slightly drop below the two, so yeah, 1.8, 1.7. Um, so it, uh, still about um, twice as efficient as an electric resistant heater. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and are you going to have the PowerPoint available that I can send to people? Yeah, I, I'd be happy to um, PDF it and, and email it to you. Okay. Uh, how, what, how do you compare the cost to a mini split for a, a two ton system, for, for example? Um, so, um, I would say um, that a mini, mini split would certainly be um, less cost, uh, less upfront cost, um, simply um, because there is uh, yeah, cost in the inflow radiant. Um, depending on, on uh, what type of inflow radiant you do, um, yeah, it costs between three dollars and uh, sometimes fifteen dollars a square foot uh, to install an inflow radiant. Um, and and so with a mini split, you obviously would not have that cost um, associated with it. Um, but I would argue that a, an inflow radiant is certainly more much more comfortable. Um, um, yeah, in terms of performance, um, I would say efficiencies are probably very similar to a, to a mini split system. A um, mini split is is easier to retrofit. Um, yeah, all you have to do is run your um, refrigerant lines and install the indoor uh, wall hung heads. Um, that is um, more challenging. I'm, I'm getting a lot of questions about um, staple up radiant. Yeah, can I uh, retrofit staple up to my to my home, my existing home, and it, 
yes, it can certainly be done. Um, it's a big mess. Um, uh, radiant on top of the floor is, is more e efficient, more output, because the heat doesn't have to travel through the whole floor assembly from the bottom to the top. Um, but um, it, it can certainly be done. It, um, there, there are solutions. Uh, question from Bruce. Do you have experience with ground source to water heat pumps and what systems would you recommend there? I certainly before I, I came across the the Arctic, um, I, I uh, designed um, many uh, geo heat pumps and uh, geo heat pump systems, and I'm still doing it. Yeah, there are some applications where where geo makes more sense, um, or yeah, you know, just because of the federal income tax credit, it it's uh, it could actually be cheaper. Um, yeah, because you would get money back through your um, uh, income tax return. Um, um, it, it really depends on the situation. Um, we would have to take a look at it, um, and you obviously would have to have uh, yeah, the, the income tax liability in order to qualify for the tax credit. Um, I would say here on the front range, um, the Arctic and uh, yeah, an air source heat pump um, beats geo efficiencies. Um, or at least matches them. Um, yeah, um, it's um, a, yeah, a geo system has to be balanced. You have to have a significant air conditioning load to feed the feed the heat back into the ground to help recover during the summer months. Um, yeah, so geo doesn't really work in the mountain towns where there's only heating. Um, yeah, that's that's a challenge. Um, it's what's no the, easy answer is what I'm saying. <laughs> what 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 would be, what's are the temperatures running in the pipes for the return and the outgoing for Supply. you're using a, you're using a antifreeze, right? Yes. So in in heating mode, um, we can produce up to 125 degrees Fahrenheit, um, but the Arctic heat pump. Um, uh, in cooling mode, we can, uh, yeah, the typical water temperature is about 45. Um, that's so that's um, it works really well for chilling, chilling water. Uh, uh, John, this is Larry Kenny. I have no idea how to ask questions other than blurt them out. Okay. Can I be useful? Sure, go ahead. Later. Okay, fine. Uh, there, there are a couple of things I think are kind of important, and that is uh, if you're going to do a system like this, you don't necessarily have to put it in the floor. You can put it in walls. You can put it in the ceilings. Uh, radiant is like that. Uh, warm air rises, but radiant goes in every direction. And there are lots of interesting examples of people that have done this, and it's less expensive, of course, if you're retrofitting. And I think that's probably a, a, a pretty decent application. Uh, you said some things about a six inch pipe instead of 12 inch pipe. It's possible to uh, have 12 inch pipe and sort of uh, put some copper fins on it and uh, get the heat transfer that you need without having to have the extra pipe. The point is that you want heat transfer and it's efficient to do it if you have a larger surface because you can run at cooler temperatures. I, I know you know all these things, Hans. I, I just thought I'd uh, point, it, point some stuff out. Uh, one of the things that I, I did about 25 years ago in a building that's uh, eight stories high in Syracuse, New York, uh, that uh, would heat on one side and cool on the other. And so what we did, uh, this is a commercial building called the Empire Building, not Empire State to be sure, it's Syracuse, New York, not New York City. And uh, so we simply pumped from the warm side to the cold side uh, using all the same plumbing. So uh, it, it, pretty simple and just a little uh, pumping power. And since it's closed loop, then the incremental cost is remarkably small and uh, substantially more elegant than having to have a, a whole different uh, set of tanks and whatnot. Uh, I have a couple of other things, let me see. 
Uh, yeah, you're certainly <laughs> absolutely right there, Larry. Um, mm -hmm. I, I totally agree. There, there are many products available, and and and, and radiant can be put in walls and, and ceilings. Actually, for radiant cooling, uh, the ceiling would be more effective. Um, but mm -hmm. so you know, there there are many different um, systems available, and and we're very flexible. Um, yeah, so it's um, that that's the message. Is it's a very flexible uh, technology. Yeah, and I've done some writing of anybody cares on on radiant cooling. Uh, the Germans have been doing it successfully, particularly in commercial buildings. Radiant heating and cooling on commercial buildings is de rigueur. Like probably ninety percent of the buildings built in Germany use it, and have yep. for twenty years. So they've solved they've solved a lot of problems. Uh, to have a large surface means that you can run run at small delta T, so you don't run into the moisture problem that you were rightly mentioning. Mm -hmm. Yes. Exactly. You did a great yeah. job, by the way. I'm impressed with the product. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, here in Colorado, I mean, we, we have no humidity to deal with. Yeah, if you have water in, uh, if you get condensation, um, yeah, you have, you either have a roof leak or a plumbing leak. It's, um, it, um, it, um, yeah, radiant cooling can be done. It's um, it's typically yeah, in, in the larger homes that have a lot of glass, and and those again are not efficient, energy efficient, even if they they buy the most expensive glass on the planet. Um, but um, yeah, there's another question from Martin. Um, uh, in regards to uh, some municipalities require um, size systems for worst case scenarios, um, yeah, which would basically oversize the system uh, for the rest of the year. Um, that um, certainly is a challenge everywhere. Yeah, the manual J represents nine, the 98 percent coldest day of the year, and and we've seen yeah in the in our chart that, that it's a tiny fraction of hours uh, in a year um, that are that cold and and so the, the system would be oversized uh, for most of the year. Um, the advantage here is um, the, the heat pump modulates so it's able to adjust on, uh, depending on the load. Um, so it's it has a throttle basically that uh, it can throttle down and reduce its output, um, but it's it's also yeah um, it, in in high efficient homes I'm um, more often than not I'm undersizing equipment actually and and then we're we're just putting in uh, yeah, little strip heaters electric resistance a backup for those few um, coldest days or hours of the year. Um, yeah, they they certainly cost more to operate, but they they are only a few hundred dollars to install, and and if you don't run them, yeah, they they don't cost any any money in standby, and and so um, it's a win-win, um, I believe, um, and and it saves money uh, upfront, and then um, it prevents the oversizing. <clears throat> Any other questions? Um, question uh, or a comment regarding warm board. Uh, certainly, warm board is a yeah, warm board is a is a plywood product that has um, an aluminum surface, um, a heat transfer plate, and it has grooves for the radiant piping to snap into. Um, it, it certainly is a very nice product, and and they offer design services, engineering services. But it, yeah, it costs twelve to fifteen dollars a square foot, um, and so um, it, uh, there's not not a lot of people who can afford that kind of money. You're putting yeah, twenty, thirty thousand dollars into a, a, the other radiant system alone um, is um, is a chunk of change, um, certainly. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, if you if it fits your budget, absolutely, I would recommend it. Um, DIY radiant. Um, the, the other certainly are some some ways um, of installing it um, on your own. Um, the, the challenge is the piping because you um, it, it comes in, in coils and um, and and that can uh, hit you in the face if if you let it um, uncoil um, in an uncontrolled fashion. It, um, it, it it's 
it can can be a big can of worms. Yeah, um, actually, there's there's a two hundred and eighty dollar uncoiler machine available from the PEX guy on yeah. Amazon. Uh, so <laughs> I, I think since all that stuff is dirt cheap, I mean, I could not believe how little money uh, the actual material costs are. Um, it would make sense then to go whole hog and buy that machine as well. Exactly, it, it, it's worthwhile. Um, it, you might be able to, to rent it also. Maybe Home Depot um, rents it. I don't know. Um, I know that Resource here in Boulder has um, has tool rental. They they might have those available also. Um, yes. If I mean, yeah, the, the kinking uh, the hoses, the, the the pipes. That is that is the challenge. Uh, yeah, or not, or not kinking it, um, because those those kinks are. Yeah, you, know, you can certainly unkink it with a hairdryer, warm it up, and um, but and that kind of quadruples the 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 time it takes to install it. Um, <clears throat> And so, and those kinks are the weak points, um, and you don't uh, really want to cut out the kinks. And then you have a, um, a connector there because those are the ones that that would leak. Yeah, if you ever have a leak, it, it it's going to be at the connector. Um, tax incentives. Um, so for air source heat pumps, there there are some incentives. Excel has a uh, has a rebate. Boulder County has a uh, rebate. Um, um, federal income tax. I believe there are still a few hundred dollars of uh, um, energy efficiency appliance uh, tax credits available. Um, the the GRO geothermal tax credit um, it was supposed to expire at the end of this year yeah it dropped from 30 to 26 to 22 percent this year and and they just bumped it back up to 26 percent um, yeah in in the um, um, the COVID relief package that was um, signed before the end of the year that bumped it back up to 26 percent I have not heard anything um, about the um, uh, Biden administration, what they're planning. Um, I, I would not be surprised. Yeah, with their uh, joining the Paris Agreement again, and and all the yeah, other. I recently heard the, the um, newly confirmed Energy Secretary. Um, I would not be surprised if there are new incentives uh, being offered. Okay, um, there's one more air source heat pumps. So the the nice thing about the Arctic unit is that the uh, the compressor is sitting outside, so we don't have any uh, anything that vibrates or makes noise. Um, yeah, in inside the house, um, uh, it, it is still very quiet. Um, so. Um, yeah, I, I get the question a lot. What's the noise level? Uh, about 55 dBA. Um, that means we could stand right next to it and we could have a normal conversation. Um, it's it's actually the the air, the blower that you hear. You don't hear the compressor. You hear the yeah, other. There's a big fan that blows air across the heat exchanger, and and, and that air is uh, airflow. That's what you hear. Um, so I would not put the heat pump right in front of your bathroom or, or your bedroom window, but um, it, it certainly is is not going to annoy your neighbors. Um, um, I, if you have a geo heat pump, the compressor would be inside of your mechanical room, um, and and there are some ways of uh, noise dampening, um, and they are even a blanket over the top. Um, <clears throat> The, um, regarding location, I, I recommend um, putting the outdoor unit, uh, the heat pump, um, on the south side of the building if, if uh, our primary purpose is heating, space heating. Um, so if you have a south-facing wall, um, yeah, putting it against that, um, it's much more cozy, um, warmer um, during the day, so your, your heat pump will um, be more efficient. 
Um, and um, if you were to use it for, for heating, uh, I'm sorry, for cooling primarily, then yeah, you should probably put it on the north side in the shade. Um, just make sure that there, in, in any case, there's enough airflow going through it. It's not obstructed in any way. Um, you may want to hose it down with a garden hose um, once a year to get rid of spider webs and pollen and, and allow good airflow across it. But other than that, um, there's very little maintenance that's required. Um, uh, so Hans, uh, you mentioned needing to recharge the temperature in the ground for a ground source. Uh, so if I wanted to do majority of the year heating, uh, how can I recharge the ground? Can I put in uh, some kind of an air source air conditioning in the attic that's enough insulated to work and cool off a second floor? to return heat to the ground or any, what solutions to return? Mm -hmm. So you, you're talking about a geothermal heat pump? Yeah. Um, yeah, so the, the geothermal heat pump, instead of um, using the ambient air as, as a, a heat source, um, we use the underground. And um, it, so it depends on your um, geology at the location, um, how good of a, um, heat exchange you have with the surrounding uh, underground. Um, yeah, if you have a lot of aquifers going through, water obviously is uh, is a very good conductor. Um, and and here on the front range, we have, we we have uh, several aquifers coming down from the mountains, um, in, yeah, in, into the plains. So so our heat transfer here uh, for geo on the front range is is typically uh, really excellent. Um, so that helps with uh, the recovery. Um, it, it's with geo. It is essential to know the the heating load um, particularly well and um, um, and, and and size uh, the well system um, accordingly. And um, yeah, so um, if if you deplete yeah, if you remove more thermal energy um, than is is able to um, be returned from the surrounding dirt, um, it, you can you can imagine it like a like a well, a water well. Um, if you're pumping too fast, um, yeah, you will get that funnel, um, the conical shape. Your water level will drop, and 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 you can imagine the, the same situation if you're extracting too much thermal energy uh, from the geo underground well system um, uh, too fast. Um, yeah, it, it, the, the, the temperature of the ground will drop. Um, and at one point, yeah, um, you could actually freeze up the ground around the well, yeah, worst case. Um, and, 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 and you know uh, that ice does not have a very good conductivity. And, and so suddenly you're your heat pump stops operating if if that if you have that situation. Um, so um, uh, when you're air conditioning, um, yeah, you would be dumping that thermal energy back into the well and and shed it over there. So that that helps recover um, the the well system. Um, it, it, it's also been reported that um, yeah, over over the seasons, several years in a row, um, heating and cooling, um, uh, you're you're actually increasing the the heat transfer rate of the underground by conditioning it. Yeah, there's the the, the word conditioning the underground, and and your heat transfer actually increases over the years. Um, so it's. Um, I mean, it, yeah, it's it's not rocket science. It's um, uh, yeah, there are there are hundreds of thousands of geo systems that are working extremely well, um, and um, there there was one system I worked on in uh, it was uh, for a house in Netherlands, and there was going to be no cooling, um, and and so we thought about installing a solar thermal system that um, yeah, solar thermal generates most of its heat during the summer months. And so we were just 
um, constantly feeding that th solar thermal energy back into the well during the summertime um, to help it recover. And um, but in the end, um, the homeowner decided to um, to not do geo at all. It, it yeah, it, it was a little bit. Um, it, it it would have been an experiment. Um, yeah, so there are are ways of uh, approaching the the no recovery and no air conditioning in the in the mountain towns. Um, it's it really depends. It's it, it but it becomes a, a highly customized system at at cost complexity. Um, we had some problems finding drillers in the mountain towns. Yeah, we have three drillers here on the front range and. Um, in eastern Colorado, but um, trying to get the drillers to to travel into the mountains um, has has been you know, the biggest challenge. Um, can uh, does the can the manual J person under do they know about this exhausting of the ground or in their calculations for the heat load or? You no, know, the, the the manual J is independent of of what you're using. You, know, you can plug in a boiler, an air conditioner, and yeah, a, a furnace. Um, it it doesn't really matter. Um, yeah, eventually you you do want to make a decision, and 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 that's the manual S portion is the other um, the sizing of and selecting the actual appliance and type of appliance. Um, but the, the manual J itself is, is simply the heating and the cooling load. Um, okay. And so that is where where does your energy go, your thermal energy? That's the, the consumer, basically. Yeah, so the manual S is what I guess I was asking about, right? Okay, yeah. So um, uh, the the Arctic heat pumps, for instance, are not, in, yeah, in the, if you, if you're familiar with Wrightsoft, one of the, the vendors, um, the the heat pumps are not in in their um, repository. Um, uh, you would have to enter the the performance data yourself. Um, but I, I'd be happy to to share that with you. And so it's 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 very simple. Uh, there's a couple other questions. I, if you have time. Sure, yeah. Want me to read it? Um, I'm seeing one. Um, about the lifespan. Um, so um, warranty is two years on the on the compressor right now for Arctic equipment. Um, but um, the other. All the components are, are brand name uh, Panasonic uh, compressors and so forth. So um, uh, can really expect a, a, a long life to, life uh, expectancy. And um, you, you want to make sure that there are no ice, uh, snow and ice will fall on the unit of, of the roof. Um, these kind of things um, that the snow plow doesn't uh, kick it over. Um, but um, other than that, um, um, it's a it's a really a solid appliance. Um, yeah, so hydronic baseboard uh, requires high temperatures. So typically, 160, 180 degrees. Uh, yeah, and that's out of reach for a heat pump at this point. There, there are some heat pumps that can go up to 140, um, but the efficiency certainly goes down um, if you ask it for the higher temperatures. Um, so, uh, unfortunately, um, yeah, hydronic baseboard is um, is out of reach for us. Um, Yeah, there are some people. They doubled up the the baseboard. Yeah, they installed it a second row, um, or they installed a longer length um, uh, baseboard. But it's still um, um, the other. The the thing with the baseboard is it it is a convector. It's not a radiator. People people call it um, uh, call it a, a baseboard radiator, but that's not correct. It it is um, it's the yeah, it, it heats the air that passes through across the fins, and and so that's why it meets the high temperature. Um, 
um, we would really have to um, have to look at the situation and um, yeah, typically yeah, a baseboard was installed in the um, 60s, 70s, 80s into the 90s. Um, it would make sense to do some energy efficiency improvements. Um, yeah, rigid insulation on the exterior, new windows, air sealing. Um, and at that point, yeah, you're probably close to a deep energy retrofit. Um, and so <laughs> it, it might make sense to, to uh, convert to radiant at that point. Um, I mean, the European style panel radiators are uh, an option too that work, um, but they're, they're expensive. They're, uh, they're not a commodity. They, they're a special order here in, in, the, in the US. Um, and um, those would certainly work with our equipment too. Um, yeah, if you have a mixing valve, and uh, so it's it's mixing from a higher temperature down, um, that typically tells me that you have a non-condensing high temperature boiler right now. Um, we would have to take a look at your system and 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 really um, see if it would work. Yeah, I've, I've, I've had one situation where um, uh, people had staple up radiant in, in a 1990s home. And, and I told them, turn your boiler temperature down to 120 and see if that heats the house you know, on a cold day. Um, you can't do that for very long because at 120 degrees, your non-condensing boiler is actually going to condense. Um, in the heat exchanger and the flue pipe, and and if you do that for too long, it it will corrode and rot away. Um, so, but if you do that for a week um, and, and just test it out, uh, that can certainly be done. And and then we would know, okay, yeah, it it's able to keep the house at 70. Um, or um, no, the temperature keeps dropping and dropping and dropping, and that tells us, okay, no, we need a higher temperature to heat the house. Um, what we've also done is, um, yeah, use the heat pump down to maybe 15 degrees, yeah, with 120 degrees, um, and then at, yeah, automatically with uh, a controller um, that um, uh, uh, realizes, okay, it's now it's 15 degrees or lower, and then it brings on a boiler at at 130, 140 degrees. So that can certainly be done. Um, yeah, automatically increase the water temperature as as it gets colder. Um, it makes it a little more complex, but it, it can be done. And it looks like the last one is that about any known improvements that you know they're working on. Um, <clears throat> So um, one one thing uh, I know they're working on are, are more um, environmentally friendly friendly refrigerants. Um, yeah, you, you're probably aware of the uh, the sand and CO2 um, heat pump uh, water heater that has an outdoor unit and an indoor unit. And yeah, it's originally it's a water heater, but um, it now I believe has. Um, uh, also certification for space heating, so it could be used for radiant. Um, that uses CO2 as a refrigerant, but that is the only unit that I'm aware of on the marketplace with that um, with that refrigerant. So um, and CO2 goes down to less than minus 40 Fahrenheit, right? I uh, I, I don't know. I I can't uh, confirm that, but. Um, it it certainly requires a, a specialty compressor, uh, specialty gaskets, and the yeah, valves and so forth. Uh, and those are um, that's why the, yeah it, I think the the unit is four thousand dollars for a water heater. Um, so um, I believe that is the future. A lot of people are working on uh, yeah um, making that available for for the yeah, mini splits and also. Um, um hydronic heat pumps but um I, I don't have any dates yet when when those will be available it's um yeah well thanks <clears throat> a lot 
Hans, this was great. Lots of good questions. And this, this is recorded. I did, did miss the first 10 minutes by accident, <laughs> but uh, I'll, I'll hopefully have this uh, downloaded in a few days. Okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you for host, hosting, John. Uh, thanks everyone for participating and, and please um, feel free to send me your email uh, questions or, or give me a call. Great. Uh, thank you much. That's have a good day. Yep. Bye-bye.